Hi everyone, um, welcome to this week's Dance Talks. This week um, I have actually several guests who are coming on to speak. Um, this week's will be focused on um, the impact dance can have on social change among in communities beyond just training dancers to be dancers. Um, and I luckily, through helping teach a class to raise money for Ballet ID in Indonesia, came in contact with uh, Christine, another woman who has a school in Guatemala that she introduced me to then a whole network of people who have incredible schools or organizations which do outreach or provide free classes, dance classes for students, and also all sorts of um, other you know services and help to the communities in the area. So I'm going to start this discussion with Christine and she's going to explain a little bit about these organizations. I'm going to invite, there's um, about four others, so five in total that will, from around the world, they're going to introduce themselves. Um, so first up, hi there, welcome. Hi. Happy Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Thursday to you too. How are you? Good? Good. I'm great. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> I'm so yeah, excited to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak. Tell a little bit about not only your organization, but um, schools and organizations similar to yours around the world and, and what y'all are doing for communities in your area. Of course, um, of course. Would you maybe like to introduce yourself and also your school? Yeah, of course. So my name is Christine Chagliari Lopez, and I am from New York, but I am now living in Guatemala, and I have a Christian ballet ministry here. And the goal is to share the love of Christ with the kids, and we do that through just teaching dance classes. Um, everyone who's a dancer knows that your dance teacher can be a second mom, or for many cases, sometimes even like a first mom. So through our programs, we're not only being there and very conscientious of how we interact with the children, but also supporting them academically, pushing them to keep their grades up, increase their grades so they come to dance class. Otherwise, they get in trouble or suspended, which they do not want. <laughs> and then we also have an orphanage dance program, and we have a scholarship program so children of all walks of life can take dance, no matter what their income is. Wow. So how did you get started in doing this? Like when did you make the decision to open a school like this that was not only just teaching ballet, but working with orphans, um, helping children also uh, with their academic side of life as well and, and those sorts of things? Well, it was actually all very organic and it was never my goal. Um, as, as you know, and as many people know, dance is very high impact on your body. And I started having a lot of knee, hip and ankle problems when I was about 18 or 19 years old and I remember like crying for two months because I could not finish a dance class without being in extreme pain in the lower half of my body. So I actually shifted away from dance and um, for school I decided that I was going into ethical fashion, working with indigenous artisans, I wanted to do that between Latin America and so that's what actually brought me to Guatemala. And as I was here, it's really interesting because I got offered my dream job twice and both times it fell through within 24 hours. And I thought that was very strange because usually when you hire someone, you look at the resume and you're aware, but each time it just so happened to like hold me here in Guatemala as I was finishing my graduate school thesis. And so in that process, I started teaching dance classes too. My first group was like five little students and one of the girls was, um, the daughter of someone who sold tortillas on the street, and so I gave her a scholarship. And then as I continued growing, because there wasn't, there's no dance teachers in this whole province, and there's only a dance school in one of the neighboring provinces. As I continued to grow, I just kept that percentage up. And then at the church I go to, which is missionaries, I heard about this one girl who was having a really hard time transitioning at the orphanage. So I offered her dance classes because I personally know how dance can help change lives. And then from her example, she actually was able to transition very well. Her grades in school increased. Um, I was told by the moms at the orphanage that she, her entire demeanor changed. She was able to interact with the girls better. She felt more confident. And I realized this is a really great tool. Like ballet can be used even for children in the most traumatic situations. 
So I started offering more and more scholarships to the kids from that local orphanage, and then I connected with another one. And so now the orphanage dance program has children who integrate into our program and dance with the children in our studio. And then also I go to the orphanage to teach the littles who aren't able to travel as much because of the distance and the cost, which we fundraise for to bring them in by a boat from one of the, for one of the particular orphanages. Wow. So that's, I know a, that's a short version. Oh, so Christine, she actually has a series of interviews with the, many of the people who are going to speak with us today. Um, but she has, each of them is going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes with us just because there's time constraints. But um, she had an hour long interview with each of them on her YouTube channel. And it's really interesting that um, quite a few of the, these organizations also teach orphans. Um, and it, I, when I was watching some of your talks, um, I found it really interesting you saying y'all were discussing the difficulty getting orphans to really feel comfortable in the studio with other children who were not orphans. Can you explain a little bit about that and how bringing them into a dance studio, making them part of the community really can help them with their development? Yes, definitely. And also just on that point, the transition and for people and children from situations of trauma or even situations where they don't feel like they're included, like what I'm about to say is I feel like it's very applicable. Um, but so for the children who come from orphanages, first, it's very important to recognize that if they are children from high trauma, a lot of times they have separation from their body and their mind. So when you're teaching them, you have to take a different approach. And so for me, it's a lot more hands on. So of course, being very careful of like how and where as a dance teacher, I'm making contact with their body. But a lot of times it's like I touch their knee and I say, this is your right knee and we're gonna move it this way. Cause sometimes I, I've seen when I give direction to students from situations of trauma, they aren't aware of their bodies as much as the other students. So I could say like, move your right arm up and they'll just stand there and like shift their weight and like move their foot. So I think there's like, it's very, very obvious too, um, especially with the cases. And then if you talk with the, the like orphanage parents, you realize and recognize that the children that come from higher trauma situations are the children that really have a lot of problem with coordination. So dance is not only bringing a more beautiful memory and creating more beautiful memories so that they can have a better relationship with their body, but it's also creating community. And so when children from situations of trauma that also live in a group home try to transition into something that's a lot more structured, it's very difficult sometimes because imagine having 20 children in a house with a mom, a dad, and maybe two like auntie employees who are helping. It's really hard to have strict disciplinary situations in a group home, of course. Yeah. So I've seen that, especially with my kids who are from the group home across the lake, which it's a larger home, um, it's really important for them to first understand how to act in a dance class because of course the dance class has its own culture the discipline how you're supposed to stand how you interact how you wear your hair even but teaching them these little things of the dance culture also helps them have pride in how they look because they know that they can do it themselves and they're excited when they can put on their dance tights put on their leotard and do their hair i remember one of the little students was like miss christine i did my hair and it was the most exciting thing because if you don't have someone who's teaching you to do these little details with your hair, accomplishing something as small as doing a ballet bun and putting a flower in it is very exciting. So it's all these little goals and these little achievements that are helping build up these children and helping them feel the love of God, which is my whole point. And then in that, building a better and more positive relationship with their body so that they can move forward in life without being fearful. Because that's one of the things too, if you come from high trauma, there's a lot of fear embedded in that. So just breaking down those walls and helping them realize their relationship with their body and their relationship with themselves so they can start really loving themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were speaking a few days ago, uh, you were talking about, and I feel like this is kind of ties into it, of maybe children coming from group homes or children coming from uh, really families in poverty where it's kind of living day by day and in, in, with those families. Um, the whole idea that like through dance and through being a sort of mentor, teaching children also the 
the concept of goal, like working towards something, you can achieve things and having long-term goals. And can you explain also a little bit about that? Like, um, the lack of, and then the result of developing this understanding of working towards something. Yes, of course. So one thing that's very important to understand with this question is that in developing countries, especially ones where people are living day to day, the idea and concept of long term goals isn't something that's focused on or taught that much. So for me in the United States growing up in kindergarten, they asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? In second grade, they asked me the same thing. They asked me the same thing in middle school and high school. But I realized that's something that children here aren't being asked. So the idea of long term goals is something that is also very important to teach kids so that they can aspire to something. And this is something I've spoken a lot with Marin from Haiti, who's going to be on the call in a, in a few minutes. She, she really helps explain it to me like from both perspectives. These kids, a lot of these children are coming from very difficult situations where their families are working day to day in order to figure out what to put on the table, how to buy uh, wood for the fire that they're going to cook. And these children have very different priorities life so also discipline and like putting all of your your extra time into something like practicing ballet is a foreign concept but when these kids realize oh chicken when these kids realize <laughs> that they can focus on a goal from young and actually and actually achieve different things like oh i did a clean pirouette or Ooh, I can do like 100 clear relevé without getting tired now. And Miss Christine in the beginning told me that I would be able to do it, and I didn't think I could do it, but now I can. And then we tell the kids, like, you can do this with other things in your future, right? Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? All these things you're learning in ballet class, you can apply to other facets of your life. I think that I yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that, that really explains it so well. Um, then one of the other things that in several of your talks, a lot of the schools or organizations who are going to um, be speaking with oh, us I'm later, sorry, the audio went off. My I audio. Oh, I don't know if it's my phone. Can you hear me now? I'm going to connect it. Okay. Let me yeah. Connect it to... Oh, maybe it's a, a little bit of a bad connection. I'm having uh, a swirling signal on here now. I don't know if it's me or if it's Christine, but we will find out. Technology, it's not my thing. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, so one of the things that you and these other schools, your school and other schools, talked about several times, like each of them was saying uh, the idea of kind of having a, a class uniform, people coming in. Um, oh, uh, so I, need, I didn't pin anything because I'm terrible at pinning. I asked for introduction again. Um, so this is Christine. She runs uh, Transformation Ballet in uh, Guatemala, and it's a, a school that works with children from different parts of the community, including orphanages. And, um, you know, it's in a, it's a ballet school in a developing country. And um, so this is the subject we're on today. Uh, so then, anyway, sorry, I was going back to, you were talking with so many of these other schools about how um, they, the, uh, like a uniform can really help with the confidence of a dancer because um, a student coming from a very poor family and then a stu student coming from a wealthier family, when they walk into the studio and they're wearing the same thing, the same leotard and the same tights, um, there's not that class system in class. And there's, there's a, a certain um, acceptance that comes with, okay, everyone is the same and we're all here to dance and we're all here to learn. Um, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Like why why it's so important maybe to, to create an environment where people are equal. Of course, of course. And actually, I'm right now in my studio, which is uh, my living room converted dance studio. So I'll actually give you a visual of this as I talk through it. So um, this is just a normal living room space, which is quite large for the apartment. This is the reason why I have it. So my students are in that position to be using this robot in the the students come in through this door and take off their outside clothes and leave them here and they have a dance to below and they actually just walk right into this section, which is the dance studio. Um, 
and I'm doing something in the way. Speak a little, a little bit louder. It's a little bit echoey now. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the Dylan Monty is from here, and this is how they come into the studio. They'll probably keep their outside clothes right here. They have all their gaps around their feet. And then, sorry, this is going to be And then they walk in through right here in the dance studio. So imagine walking in, and some students are in clothes that have holes in it and might be dirtier than other students. Some kids come walking from across town by themselves with their little sister in their hands, and other students get dropped off in a car or in a motorcycle. And when they come in here, some of them have patterned backpacks, some of them have new backpacks. But when they take off their dance wear, they're all in good-looking, beautiful dance wear, even the boys. So imagine if the kids like come in very different walks of life. It's extremely obvious who comes for money and who doesn't come for money. But when they take off their outside clothes and when their parents leave and they walk into this space, they're all in the same clothes, they have the same hair, and it's only possible because of people who have like sent donations for this to be possible. And that's what's allowing this equal opportunity. And even for the boys, discount dance supported us and sent us nice uniforms for the boys because almost all of our boys, which aren't that many, are from very difficult situations. But they say that dance helps them forget about what's happening in their life. And for a little, for 11 year old boys to tell you that, that means that things are really difficult. Like I, I am aware of the situation because their parents have shared and other people, because um, a lot of my students are also related. <laughs> But the opportunity to be able to look the same as everybody else, where in your normal life you don't, puts everyone on the same playing field. And then from that point, you're just like, I'm focusing on your technique. I'm treating you equal. If you want to give me your best, that's how I will treat you as well. So really teaching the kids, it doesn't really matter where you come from. When you walk into the studio space, you're in dance class. And what matters is how much you give, how much you believe in yourself. Now that you know that, like, I believe in you and that God wants the best for you, and that's why you always need to never give up. So nice. So you were saying, for example, um, Discount Dance sponsored y'all and, and was able to send a lot of dance clothes for the boys. Is that mostly through sponsorships or donations how you, this is possible? Because I assume you, you're not charging most of the students or I don't know if you're charging students at all or how much of it is free, how much it, it depends on, like, the situation of students, but... Um, you're covering the costs of not only the classes, but also the, the clothing and, and other aspects of helping them. So how how do you get the most help? Like what is useful? Where are you getting donations from? Where are you getting support? Yeah. Currently, I'm not charging any of the students because the area where I live in, in particular in Guatemala, it has been devastated because of zero tourism. So the main street in this town is all touristic restaurants and touristic services like going on the lake or hiking or paragliding but none of that is possible now because um the provinces are closed down so there's no national tourism the borders are closed off so there's no international tourism so currently it's not possible to charge which is very difficult because this program is run as a social enterprise locally and is registered in the u.s as a nonprofit to support all the extra programs like academics and or the orphanage program and extra workshops on health and faith so with previously 50 percent of the students paying now we're just dependent on donations and God will provide, we'll see a way. But as far as the material clothes that the kids wear, it is dance studios that do costume drives, um, Hearts to Toes, which is an organization that sends us leotards and tights many times, Traveling Tutus, which sends us costumes, and Discount Dance, which has supported us when we went to the National Dance Conference here for the first time, which actually was many of the kids' first time being in a theater, their first time dancing on a real stage, because we just do it in the local um, town hall here every year and also it was the first time going to the movies which is something extra you're able to do and their first time also wearing completely new dance wear so if it wasn't for organizations individuals even I had one individual dance student from Australia and she coordinated within her the National uh, Ballet Theater of Australia coordinated a drive and those really helped us it's it's individuals who have a heart to share an organization yeah yeah, because also I think um, 
a lot of us in, you know, more developed countries, we get so used to, oh, you buy clothes and when you grow out of it, you buy new clothes and that's just how it is. And you have clothes that is in perfectly good condition and not even considering um, donating it really where it's needed. I think a lot of times people just donate it like, okay, where do I send it? I don't know, a any which where, but if there's maybe an organization that really speaks to you, like for example, with yours, I think especially a lot of dancers don't know where to do donate their dance clothes because a lot of people tend to drop off their stuff in the US, like at Goodwill or Red Cross, um, but it's really niche dance clothes. And there are definitely schools around the world that would be very happy to have dance clothes for their students. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then I wanted to ask a little bit about like now with, uh, COVID-19, obviously it's quite a difficult situation for everyone worldwide. How has that changed um, what you are doing for your students and what you have also seen in other, the other schools you know? Like what is kind of the worldwide trend in developing countries of how dance schools are able to help their students or the families of their students? Yes, definitely. That's a really great question. That's actually the reason why I did the Real Talk series because I realized the world did not understand, and I didn't fully understand being from the United States, even if, so um, my, my dad is from Indonesia and my mom's from Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico is part of the U.S., but being my mom's age at that, Puerto Rico is part of the U.S., but definitely the idea of coming in, it was as if they were both immigrants and I'm first generation. Um, I didn't realize the difficulties that people in developing countries go through daily and when crisis strikes, I didn't realize how that really heavily impacts them. So right now, there is basically no income to pay for rent and my food and the orphanage dance program, which I love to do extra activities for these kids just so they can really feel special. Mm -hmm. and supporting kids academically. I do have a few ballet godparents who are sponsors who help particular children. But aside from that, because this was run as a social enterprise and now can't be, also I feel really bad asking people, asking the parents for money. That's why I'm like, if you can make a donation, please do. If you can't, there's no problem. Because I know that these parents are really, really sacrificing with every expenditure. So what it looks like in here in Guatemala, first of all, is a lot of parents don't know how they're going to put food on the table. But one thing is that here tortillas are really cheap. So the question isn't if they're going to starve, the question is if they're going to have malnutrition from only eating tortillas with one egg, only eating tortillas with some bean, only eating tortillas with some, tortillas with corn, just corn on corn. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, the food distribution that I just did, now we're helping 13 families twice a month consistently. One of the moms was telling me, this food that you're giving us is helping us so much. We wouldn't be able to continue having our child in school if you didn't give us food. Wow. And another mom was telling me, this is helping us so much. I wasn't sure how to basically manage my expenditures because at one point there was also not as much firewood coming in because of the COVID protecting, the COVID protective measures. So the mom was telling me, I don't want to spend money on gas. So I'm trying to figure out how to give food to my children that doesn't need to be cooked. And so it's very interesting, these things that people don't always think about. Or another parent telling me, um, aside from COVID and my husband losing his job and me losing my job, and now he has a job that sometimes he's called to work in construction and sometimes not. On top of that, her sister got sick. So the aunt is my student, and she said, now we're trying to figure out how to help two families in a time where no one has money and also pay for medical expenses. So the food is helping feed so many children. And in some countries, like you'll see when you speak to Daniel, it's always been similar to this. So the COVID situation, they never really knew how they were going to feed themselves, but now it's even worse. I think we lost Christine. I'm gonna see if we can get her back in. Must have dropped a connection. Let's see, add. And see if she comes back. If not, if she's lost her connection for a little bit, we'll go and we'll, we'll start. Oh, okay. Just went out. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I think the one, the one thing I would like to really share with people is that, you know, if you think that a dollar is not a lot for you, a dollar really goes far because you can buy four tortillas with 13 cents here. So 
So imagine how much if you donate $20, you can really feed a family. And also, aside from feeding the children, you can give them dance classes and internet access so these kids have food in their bellies and then can have a distraction even though they're inside because your children aren't really allowed to leave. So all children are staying inside of their house for months, it's month number four. Yeah. And do you see a difference with the students that, because, um, so I had seen Christine explain that she was, was using fundraising to pay for data because not all students have stable internet um, connection. And so she was paying for data so that the students could have internet connection to do online classes with her from time to time. And do you see a, um, a significant change in maybe their morale, their mental health when they have this class, the way they are when they still have this, even if they have to stay at home? Oh, I think Christine froze again. Let's wait a second. Nope. Are you there? Hello? Hello? I can hear you. Okay. Yes, definitely. Well, our children who are able to have internet connection, it's, it's amazing because without that, they wouldn't have dance. And, you know, I just asked my students to send me a video to share, like, why do you dance? What do you feel like when you dance? And why is it important for Transform of Jambalette to continue? Because I'm about to start a fundraiser because... I need to somehow fund the program for the rest of the year because I know that here it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. But one of my students, he sent me a video of him dancing and at the end he finished like this, like with one knee on the ground. And then he was like, when I dance, I feel like I'm in the clouds. Thank you, Miss Christine. And then other students who tell me, I feel so free when I dance or students who don't know how to explain how they feel when they dance, but they're like, I dance because I just really, I love it. And if they don't have hobbies, because a lot of times like, you can play outside, but the idea of having a hobby really comes from having the extra time. So if you have students who are like working, and who are, you have students who are like 9, 10, 11 years old, who are actually working aside from going to school, then have dance, dance becomes a hobby. So that's something you don't really think about, having an 11 year old who's like selling something on the street to tourists and then comes to dance class, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. So it really, it gives students a clean, safe, space where they're pushed, which is like, it's like tough love. You mm -hmm. love them, but you're also pushing them and you're trying not to baby them. Although I sometimes like, I just crack. They're like my little baby beans always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's also one of the things I wanted to ask about was, because um, uh, in some of your discussions that I'll, I'll say again for people who are just tuning in that uh, Christine has several of these talks, like longer talks with the different people who will be featured today on um, this ballot dance talk. Um, and there are a bunch of different schools around the world and a lot of them touched on the, the fact of, you know, the, the fine balance of being sensitive to the difficult situation many children are coming from, but then also being like having expectations, being demanding and giving structure and discipline because of how that benefits the children as well. Yes, definitely. It's so important, honestly, as it is in all dance studios, but to understand the student individually and to take that extra time. It takes away time. It takes time away from training, but it's so important because my number one goal is to help build these children up. And you can't do that if you don't understand how you need to treat them because they might come up from a situation of trauma or how far you need to push them or for example, I have a student that both of their, their dads died and some days they have horrible days. They like don't want to follow instructions. They are a complete distraction in class, but then they break down and start crying. And I'm like, oh, okay, I know. I understand why this is happening because it's one of those days when they really miss their dad. And so things like this. And, and, and it, also there's a lot of communities around the world where their fathers aren't very present around the whole world. So understanding which students come from situations like that and how to express healthy love to them mm -hmm. and how you speak with them and how you like high five them or the words that you say to be encouraging. But in that also realizing that you don't want to leave behind your students who come from a healthy home situation because you never know what's really happening at home. Yeah. So it's really going back to the individually understanding them. And like sometimes children who come from the orphanage, for example, they may have had a crazy, even a crazy um, an hour and a half getting to the dance studio and that will really impact how they act in class but like knowing that you have to still make sure that they're on their game ready for dance class 
while pushing them hard, because knowing that in life, you're going to get into situations where you need to be prepared, no matter what happened before, but also being sensitive. So a lot of different aspects. Wow. Um, so just to then kind of wrap up this before I start inviting in the, the other directors of these other schools and organizations, um, do you want to share, are there any other really key points about uh, organizations like your own that you would like that other people really know about or maybe things that you find for you in Guatemala, like what is probably the most challenging workaround of keeping this, this school afloat? Yes, definitely. Well, the most important thing, I think, for people who are coming from a developed country perspective and connecting with students from developing countries is one, understanding, first and foremost, understanding that you are not better than them, you are just in a different situation. And realizing that there are so many things you connect, can connect with them in. Mm -hmm. And then from there, recognizing if I am in a place where I can help them, like, why not? And also, yeah. if I am helping them, recognizing that I can also learn from this experience, I'm not just giving. So through our ballet godparent program, you can sponsor a child and you have, like, video pen pals. You can send them gifts. And then also our students are learning about other cultures. And, of course, it, I'm present, too, so that it's safe for the children and the, the ballet sponsor. But if you're going to invest, also, it's so important to know that it's not just one-time thing you know like one-time help is of course so important and helpful but if you're going to invest in a child it's important to not just be there for one second and give them this amazing experience and then leave them hanging with expectations so just realizing that these kids and kids all around the world they just need love and to know that they can be successful and then that that's where we should be coming in as adults Oh, that's so beautiful. I mean, it's so true. I think um, that happens a lot with when people are intending to to help groups kind of going way over the top and doing one big gesture um, when actually kind of consistency, maybe continuous small help is actually more useful in the long term. Yes, definitely. And so like with my program, I'm, I allow short-term volunteers to come in but also being aware of the relationships they're building with the children and telling the children, like, this is the one-time thing. Or if it's someone who intends to have a long-term relationship with the studio, like giving classes every now and again, just so the children are aware of that, because especially kids who come from situations of trauma and heartbreak, you don't want to continuously break the heart. But definitely, if you want to support programs, um, honestly, money pays for the electricity. Money pays for this dance space where I teach. Money pays for extra dance shoes if we need them. It pays for the, the rental space for our, for our presentation, for our recitals. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. So every type of support is so, is so necessary. But just being very yeah. aware of where you're coming from and how your every moment actions impact others. Great advice. Thank you so much for really explaining um, basically the bigger picture of what, what dance schools can do in their community, especially for communities that are really in need. Um, and thank you also for putting me in touch with all the other people who are about to follow. Um, so after this whole talk is done, I'm going to include links to all of the schools and also um, links to, pos to donate um, to each of these if you would like to donate um, and that will be in both the comment section but also I will put up some stories so that you can just click directly through those um, but thank you again Christine and I'm going to go ahead and uh, start bringing on the rest of your crew of all these people around the world that uh, are yeah and also just to mention it's definitely it's because of like ABP official and traveling futures that I was able to connect to all these amazing studios and I'm going to start a hashtag dance around the world so that everyone can be aware of all these amazing programs around the world. And then because people, they create such an in, impressive and inspiring network. So I hope that all the watchers, and thank you, Shelby, for your time. I hope everyone can really learn something from it and grow from it too, even from the just listening. Great, great. Thank you so much. And take care. Of course. Bye. God bless. So next up we have... Um, Mariska from Ballet ID in Indonesia. So let me see if she's here. Yes, add. And we are going to wait for her. 
I met her through a colleague of mine actually um, here who works with me in Valley Flanders at um, Juliet Burnett. She's Australian and Norwegian and she was the one who made the first introduction. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good to see you again. Well, thank you. Um, welcome to Dance Talks with Biscuit Ballerina. Um, so why don't you start by introducing yourself and also what your, your organization. Okay, my name is Mariska Febrani. I come from Indonesia, based in Jakarta. And uh, I run a, a non-profit organization called Ballet ID. So I think it's, we are a little bit different with the rest of the ballet school because yeah, I think some of the people still thought that, that we are a ballet school, which is not. We're a non-profit organization that we aim to enabling the, the supportive environment for Indonesian dancers to develop. Because we saw so many talents um, yeah, for the past six years, because we started in 2014, and then we saw so many talents in Indonesia, and then um, that's how we create uh, this foundation. Uh, we create a platform to provide a chance for Indonesian dancers to develop through cultural uh, exchange, uh, as well as the collaboration between the local and international um, artists and teachers and dancers. And our key point, like um, our program, like I can divide our program into three, which is skill enrichment for, for the whole, like we always open our program for everyone, for the dancers mm -hmm. in Indonesia, because it's normally for, uh, with the open audition and also for uh, disabled people and also underprivileged kids as well. So uh, the skill enrichment, we do mm -hmm. the skill enrichment by doing like the master classes or like sending Indonesian dancers abroad. Like last year we did uh, in a collaboration with uh, Strat Dance Australia. So we sent oh. three dancers yeah, to, uh, to do the master classes for uh, Hoffa Schachter uh, oh, wow. master classes. Yeah, so it's two times, like two weeks each. Uh, I cannot remember. I think like the first one in 2008, 18, and then 2018, and then the second part is 2019. Yep. And then after that, like we also do the showcase as well because we want to promote Indonesian dancers. Like because of so many talents, like I really hope that we can put Indonesia in the world ballet map or like world Indonesian world world uh, dance map. Because, like, yeah, it's, I saw so many talents, and then they deserve a chance. I believe that. And then the other one is the, the outreach program, which is um, we give a free dance uh, class for the underprivileged kids. And then, yes, it's true, like, the idea, like, the idea came from Juliet Burnett, which is Indo half Indonesian Australian ballet dancer. And then at that time, in conjunction with our first Indonesian Ballet Gala in 2015. Um, actually, I think this idea, it's uh, uh, since a long time ago. Since a long time ago, it is her idea with her uncle, her late uncle, W.S. Kendra. They mm -hmm. really want to bring ballet or like dance to the underprivileged kids. Because I think we also, we all have the um, understanding and then we believe that arts heal the heart and then that's why we want to bring um, art to the people that probably they never get a chance to feel it yeah to to do it and then or or maybe just to uh, enjoy to watch it and everything yeah so it started from there so yeah we and so it kick start in 2015 with the um, funding from the Australian Embassy mm -hmm. and then we still we still run that program until now, even though it's wow. only one one time one time a week one time yeah once a week, it's every mm -hmm. weekend. But yeah, we still uh yeah we try our best to keep running the program, yeah because we have really small foundation, only five of us in the foundation, and um, we work voluntary in the foundation. That's why uh, sometimes we get donation from the people, and the other time like it's just from our own pocket. But mm -hmm. basically, like. It's free, and then um, because we don't have the studio, we have to run the studio. Sometimes, like um, we get the studio for free, or the other the other time, like we really have to run the studio. And then if we don't have any budget, and it means like it comes from our own pocket. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's more or less that I run in Jakarta. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm really amazed constantly. I for as a nonprofit organization, 
what um, beautiful events you put together, like these master classes and, and workshops and then performance opportunities that um, really like on a budget, you're really trying to make the most of it and give local Indonesian dancers exposure to the international scene, but then also provide like quality experiences for the underprivileged um, students in Indonesia. So what, what, how is that possible? Like, what is the biggest challenge of kind of making this happen? Is it a lot of, um, you know, just hoping, like you said, maybe you don't have to pay rent for the studio for these master classes or people volunteer their time. What, what has been the most helpful maybe in facilitating all of this? I think the most challenging, it's honestly, it's the funding. Because like um, the past six year, uh, because there's no like a, a long time funding. Like, I mean, like the, normally like the fund is only like one off, only for one program. And then mm-hmm. you want to run this program like as long as we can to give the best like outcome for the people in Indonesia. So it's like every year, like the program like we have, because like we have um, our own program is like, which is annual, annual summer course and also mm-hmm. the gala and also the outreach program. So it's every year, like we try to knock people door to say like, this is our program. Would you like to help us and something like that? And yeah, most of the time it's all about the funding. I mean, like, because the idea and also like, um, I talk to a lot of people, especially like the dancers or also the artists, like they really want to collaborate. But to be honest, we all need the funding to make it happen. Mm-hmm. And it's, sometimes it's really hard. I mean, like, it's really different in Indonesia because I think because we don't have like the dance, like professional dance company, it's really hard to say like how much you really have to pay the dancer. And most of the time, it's really honest from my side because I, I, I am still dancing as well. We just, it's uh, like every time there's an the opportunity to dance or to um, perform, sometimes just, like we can say just like, you don't have to pay me. You already pay me with the opportunity, something like that. Oh, because wow. there's no, like, because there's no base like, like rate or like how yeah. much you charge a dancer or something like that. Yeah, there's That's no standard, like, like, a, like yeah. you know, industry standard that you have in a lot yeah. of uh, Western world where ballet is already really yeah. ingrained in the culture and, and that sort of thing. And yeah. I'm, I'm so amazed. So I, I taught class for you that as a, a series of classes that are raising money now due to COVID for arts workers in Indonesia. So your organization is not only working with children and dance students, but just also artists in general and raising money for um artists who who are out of work now due to the current um pandemic um can you talk a little bit more about how you decided okay you're going to pursue this and actually it works out quite well that online like when we were speaking you were like normally i couldn't afford to bring you to indonesia but thanks to the internet like you can teach class to to these people in indonesia it's because we, we normally have the annual summer course but we couldn't have it this year so I think like the idea, like I, I came up with the idea is like, I think we need to do something else. And besides like, I'm also a dancer. I'm also a dancer. I'm also a teacher. Like uh, we've been staying at home for four months. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm lucky enough that I still can teach online. So I still get the money from teaching, even though it's not like, not like big amount or something, but at, at least it's enough to survive. <laughs> but yeah. there are many people like art workers in Indonesia that like, they really earn money from the performing i mean like not in the theater like a dance company but i mean like sometimes like they just perform in the street or something um like during like chinese new year or something and then there's no event at all and this is already four months or at least of four months already and i really want to help them i mean like i have nothing to offer but i have heart for them and then i just think like why don't we do like the workshop and hopefully we can raise money and to help mm-hmm. them and then the idea is for the workshop after uh, this for the fundraising. And then now the idea is uh, we want to give like a small grant to the organization, the art organization, so they can create something. And then we can put together uh, a film so uh, people can watch it online and then to also to promote Indonesian uh, artists as well. So that's oh, the amazing. idea. Amazing. 
I think that's that's wonderful. Also, like the more like if you have a film or something, the more that you can reach a, a more global community and and help make those connections because um, that's really how the art world works. Is it's it's not just you know within your own country everywhere. It's so global at this point that the best way for something to thrive is to have those connections and be acknowledged internationally. That you know exchanges can happen or or scholarship opportunities can arise for students because they were seen in a school in Indonesia, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, is there okay. anything else before I go on to the, the next organization? Is there anything else you would really like to share or something that you feel like is a really important point of ballet ID that you would like people to know before uh, we say goodbye? I just would like to thank you. Like, thank you so much, like, especially for the fundraising. But we really need your help. I mean, like, I really hope that we can uh, raise money to help them, to help the Indonesian worker to stand back on their feet. I mean, like, mm -hmm. maybe it's not much, but at least we give a hope. We can give, like, a small grant for them so they can back to create something. And also for the children, especially underprivileged kids. And also, like, we also work with the people with disability. So it's like, I really hope, I just want to give hope. Because I think like it's not all about the money sometimes, and I just want to give hope that someday we can overcome this, and then Indone Indonesian dancing will grow more and more, something like that. So thank okay. you, thank you for being part of the masterclass as well. Oh, yeah, thank you for your generosity. Right. Yeah, but I think especially in this moment um, in history, hope is probably one of the greatest things we can have and the greatest things we can give other people to help mentally, yep. emotionally, everything get through what's happening. So, yes. well, thank, thank you. you very much for taking time. I know it's very late over there, but thank you for staying up to, <laughs> to talk with us. Thank you. Thank and once you, again, I, will, I have links for if you'd like to donate to Ballet ID, that will be included in the description of this video once it's posted um, permanently on my page for Instagram television. Uh, thank, thank you. Take care. Thank you talk so much. You too. Take bye. care. Bye bye. Okay, so next up, we have Marin from Haiti. She is the director of the Institut de Danse, uh, Lynn williams Rousier, and she should be joining any moment now. And she is going to be telling us about um, the current situation with her school in Haiti. They've been around for quite a while. Um, and she, she's also going to tell us like what they were doing prior to COVID. Haiti also has had some very difficult uh, political situations. So a lot of the students were actually already doing classes online prior to COVID-19 because of a need to stay at home and kind of safety measures. Um, but she'll, she'll explain this a little bit more coming up. So we'll just wait for her to connect. Hopefully any second soon. Waiting. Maybe I'll connect again. I'm gonna unable to join. Hold on, let me try one more time. And if not, then I will go to Daniel and come back to mine after. Hi. Great, hi. How are you? Good, how about yourself? I'm okay. Good, good. I'm out. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself and your school? Hi, I'm Marine Rousier from Haiti and I'm assistant director of Institut de Danse and William Rousier. And we will be, for the year 2020 to 2021, celebrating our 55th anniversary. Amazing. So, as you said, we've been around for a very long time. And what we're trying to do in Haiti is, through ballet, through dance, give kids an equal opportunity to life. I mean, we don't only want them to dance. We want them. We're a school that we have kids from all sorts of life. And we want to give kids friendship, you know, Friendship with somebody that's a lot, that has more opportunities than you, gives you in the future a better chance to get a better job or because that's how the world works. That's how Haiti works. And not only are we teaching these kids ballet, I don't know if you followed us, we're taking them to YAGP, we're winning third places, we're, and they're, they're becoming real friends and they'll help each other out longer in life. Later yeah, in I life. loved your, um, I watched your talk with Christine and 
I just found it so amazing that um, you all were raising the funds and going to compete in YAGP and really getting these students up to a competitive level and, and really succeeding. And, and you have, and then you had also mentioned, like, if you can get students to leave Haiti to live somewhere else that's maybe in a better situation right now and train there, you're, you're also facilitating that. It's, it's one of our big goals for trying to help get our students out. We have Ron Ayel, one of our teachers. He's, mm -hmm. He wants to stay with us, but every summer we usually send him to New York to summer programs. Well, of course, this year he's not going anywhere, so he's with us. He's here with us. But, you know, getting our students, getting 40 kids from Haiti to walk into YAGP is an eye-opener. I mean, we love YAGP, and we thank them for everything they do to us. But it's also a big eye-opener for YAGP to receive 40 Haitian kids. You know, it's, we, sort of stick, we sort of stand out when we get there. But you, um, I love what you said also in, in your talk, and then you also just kind of briefly mentioned it now, but the idea that with your school, you really, you hold everyone to a high standard, but you want these dancers from all different backgrounds to work together, really be a team, a family, and develop these connections that later in life, it's going to help them because it's so true networking in school. That's how you help yourself get jobs later or make connections to find out about possibilities and opportunities. And um, can you talk a little bit about maybe the, the social interaction of so many students from very different backgrounds and, and how you um, kind of fully make it all harmonious that they really do understand each other when they're coming from some, such different places? I watched your chat with Christine and, and everything she said is exact. Like when they come from the big homes in the orphanages, they tend to stick together in a group and it's really hard to get them to separate and make friends with the other kids. And mm -hmm. having a very strict uniform, I mean, people say we're over the top with the uniform, but we're extremely strict on the uniform. And there's a reason for that because once everybody's in uniform, everybody's the same. So mm -hmm. that sort of helps the kids to spread out and make more friends. When they come from the group, from the group homes, the first week we let them stick in their little group and then we sort of force them to not we sort of force them to spread apart, make friends with the other kids. And a lot of it is about tough love because, yes, they come from difficult situations, but that's not mm -hmm. the reason that every day there's a big problem. Every day you need an extra cuddle. So it's also knowing the balance, when to cuddle and when it's okay to scream and when it's okay to, to be tough. And when you, because the child that realizes that, okay, today I said my daddy and my mommy are fighting and you hug them, well, mommy and daddy can't be fighting every day. So it's to know when... The child's trying to take advantage that the orphanage didn't feed me enough to mm -hmm. the child that just wants an extra plate of food. Because mm -hmm. you might be giving a child an extra plate of food when another child actually really needs that extra plate of food. So it's, it's a very hard balance. Sometimes you go to sleep and you don't know if you did the right thing. Did I push this kid away without, for no reason? And it's always toss the coin and hope for the best. And it's not an easy situation to live. Yeah. One of the other things um, that you mentioned was, so y'all don't only teach ballet, you have also different styles of dance that's taught in the school, and one of them, so I think you, it was hip hop, but then also Haitian folk dance? Yes, we that do our Haitian. In terms of them knowing like their culture and where dance comes from in their culture and not just from uh, other parts of, you know, kind of worldwide recognized dance. Yes, like even the, the piece that we played, we won, we, third, we placed third place in YGP last year, was mixed ballet and Haitian folk dance. Amazing. Um, they do hip hop because everybody wants the American culture, but we, that's optional. Haitian folk dance is not optional. Even if you're Russian, you're Japanese, you're American, you come to our school, you learn the Haitian culture because you are in Haiti, you need to know what Haiti is all about. You need to be able to represent that flag and raise that flag and be proud to be Haitian. You can't, we are not gonna push our culture aside. We are not gonna forget who we are. And I think the Haitian culture helps them have a little bit more attitude and mm -hmm. character when they dance. Because let's be honest, our Haitian kids, they can't dream about being a pretty butterfly. Butterflies don't fly around here, bullets, you know. We have bullets flying, rocks throwing, tires burning. So we get the character from our, from our culture, not from being a pretty princess. It, it just doesn't work for us. So yeah. we have to do it through another way. Can you explain a little bit for um, probably not everyone who's viewing is so aware of the political situation that was happening in Haiti and why it was so difficult for your students to attend class regularly prior to COVID? 
19, could you explain like how you were running the school and how you were getting kids to class sometimes or not? Okay, I'm gonna have to go back for two years for everybody to really understand. So today is our two year and two, and two day anniversary that our school got burned down in a political riot. It was after our 55th anniversary, we had some donations come in and we had completely remodeled the school. We had five studios and everything. And there was a political riot and for no particular reason, our school was burned to the ground and we lost everything. So we've been renting a studio and it's been really hard on us. And last year, the political situation kept going and we were in a series of months called Beilok. Beilok means locked country. So kids, were not, kids couldn't go to school. It's basically the pandemic, but with tires, thro- tires burning, rocks throwing, like locked at home. So yeah. from September to mid-November, our children were locked at home this year. And we mm-hmm. have been doing the Zoom classes for some of the kids, the kids that had internet, the kids that didn't have internet. It was basically my husband's ex-military, so he would be watching and, okay, today, today's a little bit safe. You can, you can go have class. So it would be, what's up the parents? We can have class at four o'clock. Whoever makes it, makes it. And it was just day by day. When we can get to class, we got to class. If we couldn't get to class, those could do Zoom, could do Zoom. And from mid-November to when the pandemic started, which was about three months, we had regular classes and now we're back stuck at home. Wow. And now wow. we're able to take about six kids per class. So some of the yeah. kids are coming to the studio, but it's very minimal. So it's been a very tough year. And like I told you, we're, we're paying rent for this building, which is extremely expensive. And the kids are not even coming. So it's like, we're just literally throwing money away. Yeah. How, how have you seen, um, so not just with COVID, but then the, the, the impact on your students emotionally and mentally going through the political situation, finally almost getting back to normal and then going into this? I think the political situation in COVID had made my students fall in love with ballet, with dancing even more, because it was that one stable thing. Like IDD always made sure that they had dance. I mean, my Mm -hmm. phone, all my students know my phone number. They can call me at whatever time if they need to talk. I think my students have become more attached to dance because that's the one stable thing that was always there. It's sad that we were 80% ready for our mid-year show and the country locked down 10 days before the show. So I think the kids got hit pretty hard with this one, but Mm -hmm. I want them to know next year will be our 55 anniversary. So we will, hopefully we'll hit it hard. Good, good. Um, Before I let you go, is there anything else? Are there any other details about your school or your students or, you know, maybe sharing what what is the most difficult part? Like, what is the biggest obstacle to overcome with running such a school? The most difficult part is, like everybody else, it's fundraising. I mean, we're paying rent right now. We started three weeks ago. We're rebuilding our building. So it's really tough on us because we still have to pay rent till we can move in. So it's just, we're really, and a lot of the parents have lost their jobs and we're not. We froze a little bit. Let's see if she comes back. In just a moment. Marina, are you there? Wait a second and I'll see. Maybe I have to disconnect and then reconnect to her. Um, if she doesn't come back. And then we add again. Oh, I think she doesn't have a connection right now because she's not on the list of people I can look up. Let me search. IDD. Okay. We'll wait a second and see if she can come back to continue explaining a bit what is, um, I mean, she was, it's really, you see it with everyone that I'm speaking to, the the hardest part is just getting the funds to sustain this because it's not, well, many schools in in more financially stable or developed countries can have tuition from students that are really keeping them afloat or um, was more profitable because so many of these schools are putting their students on scholarship or uh, maybe the entire school is free for their students or they're also providing so, so much uh, help outside of just the dance classes. It really is a financial struggle. 
Um, so I, it's very understandable that when I ask this question, like what is the, the biggest challenge, every single one of them is saying funding, trying to get funding and, and support to keep their um, programs running. Okay, so I'm going to, I'll see if maybe Maureen comes back later, I can add her back in, but I'm going to go on to our next person. So that's going to be Daniel from Leap of Dance Academy in Nigeria. So we'll wait for him to join and he should be on soon. So Daniel's school actually went Hello. viral. Hi. Ah, good afternoon here in Lagos, Nigeria. So nice to meet you, Daniel. <laughs> Pleasure's all mine. So good to see you. How are you today? I'm great. I'm really great. I can't complain. Um, oh my God. I, I, it's actually very honorable to actually see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want yeah. to first say, um, to the people viewing now, a lot of people might already know your school because your school went a little bit viral online Woo! thanks to the video of your student dancing Thank outside you. in the rain. Yeah. Such a beautiful, such a beautiful video because you just see his passion in it. You know, he's, he's dancing with so much heart and it just, mm. it, it, it really touched me also when I saw it. And then once I wow. saw it, then like it was all over Instagram. Every single person <laughs> came away. Really exactly. Fun. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very so much. Can you, um, introduce yourself and, and uh, tell us a little bit about your school. Okay, um, my name is Daniel Owosheni Ajawa. Um, I'm actually a Nigerian and I run Lip of Dance Academy. Um, Lip of Dance Academy started in the year 2017 on this 9th September. Um, I can't actually forget that day because it was, I remember it was a rainy Saturday. Mm -hmm. And it was just small, but it was it was actually what I really wanted to do, and I was so excited about it. Yeah. So basically, that's me for now. <laughs> great, yeah. great. Thank you. And I know from your um, talk with Christine that I watched on YouTube, um, she was asking, you know, how is this school running? And you were saying, I have a day job, and with what I make for my day job, then you know, I can live on my own, and then I do the classes for free, and. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about who they're including, where are they coming from? Um, my students actually come from a very, very um, low financial income um, homes because um, most of our parents here, they work to eat and no work to save. Because, um, you know, it's, if you know where I, I come from, I actually stay at the far end of Lagos, Nigeria. That's very close to the water side. So it's nothing really happening around here. So being able to situate a ballet school here is a whole lot of work. And, you know, we don't even have our own space. So, but then we're very passionate about ballet. That's why we, we are just striving and keep on doing what we're doing. So um, our students are not from wealthy homes because the area is actually um, a residential home, but very, very low income families and low income resident area. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so how, how has it been with students? That, because you, your class, like I love the videos, they're really so disciplined. And in one of your posts, you were saying it's so important really to use the proper vocabulary with ballet that they're learning it uh, yeah. correctly and they're they're developing a, a deep understanding of um, like ballet yeah. in, in its correct yes. form terminology and mm -hmm. and all these different things um, yes. how has it been for them suddenly you know in the last few years since you started this school having the opportunity to really learn ballet and some of them are with point shoes even yeah yeah, it's actually very um, amazing for our kids there because they really love ballet and um, it was hard in the beginning where we started, but as we begin to progress, they begin to love it. Like our students do not just do ballet for um, recreational purposes. Most of our students are vocational students. In fact, every child who comes to the Leap of Dance Academy is a vocational student because we believe in dance education. And because dance education is not popular in Nigeria, Everybody who wants to dance just goes to dance and goes. They don't even know what the PA is, how to do all of this. So my own students must know how to write it down in pen and paper and know how to memorize it because I am training them to be able to represent Nigeria internationally. That's why um, I'm very, very, part I'm very, very concerned with the educational aspect of everything. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Um, but they're they're so strong. I was watching some of the videos, and I was like, like just the, like the pure strength in the legs. I was like, they're so developed. It's such an amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
what what have you seen how has ballet impacted your students have you seen um a change in maybe confidence or drive or what what sort of personality developments or uh mental emotional changes have you seen with students who enter your school and really start working in a very concentrated way on ballet okay now first of all i, I would like to share that i'm actually a self-trained ballet um dancer and teacher so wow. everything i actually learn or teach my kids actually from what i learned personally from internet and um, youtube videos and before i started getting help from my friends like miss mary miss christine and miss talima and very amazing people miss uh, marla and miss linda from the san um, jose ba ballet theater like that so my what is my inspiration to my children is the fact that i tell them that i didn't have this opportunity to go to a very fancy ballet school like you guys are having, not like it's a fancy ballet school. We do not really have a mm -hmm. home space, like I said before, but I do not have the opportunity. So my drive is that you must be better than me. I don't want to give you the opportunity to say, oh, I, I didn't have anybody to help me. So the drive is that they say like, oh, my teacher didn't have anybody to help him, but now he's helping us. So that is their, their fuel. That's like their gas, you know? It just keeps them burning. Yeah. So it's like, if my children could not do it, I can be able to do it. So that's the driving force that makes moves us to what we're doing now. Yeah. Wow, that's so beautiful. Thank you very um, much. Uh, so what, what is your studio situation? What, what sort of space are you rehearsing with them in? I saw, and I, when you were talking with Christine, you were explaining, mm -hmm. you know, uh, very expensive to have a crew dance floor. So yeah. you, you put down some, like, linoleum mm -hmm. over tile yeah. or... Uh, I, I would like to show you, we don't have our own space, so we just use this outside. Can you see that? And so that's yes. our ballet bar. So that's the space we used, just the, rock, the concrete floor. So nothing, nothing really serious here. And the bars are just here, waiting for the kids to come. So it's not like we have a studio, we do not have a studio. That's just the space we use. But when we want to train, we tend to take them to a space where we got from our friend, so let me just connect this down back. So our friend actually just allows us to use that once a week. That's when we have classes. Wow. Yes. So when we want to take proper ballet videos like um, pictures so that the kids don't have to train in a very um, unsafe environment, we just have to get that space, then put some curtains on the wall and all of that to make it very, very fine. Yeah. Mm. And... Um... I know I also saw in, in your talk with Christine that uh, you were saying there have been some groups, I think you said in San Jose, that there, there were teachers who were helping you to teach your students and, and offering online classes to your students. Can you tell a little bit about exactly. like, what other people have been able to contribute to your school and like what is super helpful for, for you and your students? Yes, it, it's been, I, I must tell you that it's been very, very helpful to actually have all these very, very um, well, professional teachers or educated teachers to help us because you know being a self-trained person I, I don't want to limit myself to oh i know how it's done on youtube but you know youtube videos cannot just give you the exact thing a life teacher will give you so i reach out to very amazing um teachers like miss linda hoxman so she's been helping us with zoom classes and helping to correct some postures and everything then also miss kat wildish has been very amazing every tuesday she dedicates Tuesday for us. And she teaches wow. us ballet every time, like every time and every time. So I was able to get certified on acrobatic arts recently uh, because of amazing partners that were able to say, oh, Daniel, I think you need to get better than what you're doing. Because I love acrobatic arts, but Dan was able to help me. She was able to help me, and that's how it is for now. Wow. And how I saw so some of your students, they do have point shoes. But yes, they do. How, how have they been able to s learn to dance on point when I can imagine in Nigeria it's quite warm and if you're close to the water it's quite humid, shoes die pretty quickly. What, what are your students doing to preserve their point shoes so they can still dance on point from time to time? Okay, like what my students do for their points is that like in, in Nigeria, first of all, there are no ballet stores where they sell ballet things. So anything you see that is a ballet here in my academy was actually donated by traveling tutors with amazing people that always help to get all those things. So there are no ballet stores here. It won't work here, but then we're trying to make sure it's standing here. So for my kids, what we just do is that we just keep it in a separate, just cool air area so that 
it doesn't get damp or something. But then we keep it in a very, very safe area. So that's just it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Thank also, you. again, like many of the other schools, like also Christine was talking about for her school in Guatemala, um, it's really so important to have people who are willing to donate dance supplies, dance, like dance clothing, oh. shoes, things like that to provide because it's not so easily accessible. It's not like you walk mm -hmm. down the street and have your local dance shop that you can pick Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, so on a very, very serious note, it is very, very important that we, um, because students like us, Miss Christians and Miss, uh, Miss Mary Ann and Miss Heidi, um, our students really need a lot of help because like for me, my program, my kids don't pay for, for dance. Every child in my academy, takes free dance classes. They don't, they don't pay for costumes. They don't pay for anything. I will actually give them food and all those things. So it's very, very financially involving. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is very, very, in fact, it, is, it, it takes a lot of finance because these are kids. You know, kids must grow. They need to eat. You can't actually get a child to dance when they don't have food in their stomach. So it's very, very financially involving. It's, if, 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 if there's no finance, if there's no um, donations through... Um, maybe dance words or something. It doesn't really help it. Like, uh, we just have two ballet bars out there. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do some other things, kids have to wait until their turn. So uh, you can imagine. Yeah. So, so, yeah. We have, so you can't actually go into the bar like everybody just goes to the bar. Sometimes we have to hold a wall for dance classes. But so it's hard. But then, you know, because we love what we're doing, we just need support, we need help. And we just keep on doing what we're doing because we don't want to just stay and say, oh, nobody's helping me, so let me just stay like that. If not, we'll not be able to do anything. So we'll just keep on doing what we're doing. And that's it. Wow. I mean, Thank amazing. You. It's so inspiring, the determination, and then also what you are doing with all of that determination and so few resources. Um, Thank you. What uh, I wanted to ask then, um, you said like you, you feed your students sometimes because you, you, can't get, you can't expect dancers to dance on an empty stomach. Um, exactly. Uh, can you tell a little bit about, also, you know, did you start offering food to your students right off the bat or was it you were teaching and you noticed, oh, some of these students are hungry and I need to offer some food? That's the point. Like some, like, um, not necessarily that, that I, I just saw that they needed food or something. I, I, you know, when they begin to come for dance classes, like, and you, you can be able to see the expression in their faces, like, oh, this child hasn't really gotten something. Then you ask, how are you? They were at first very shy, like they couldn't say anything, like they didn't want to say anything, like anything. But as I begin to progress and get close to them and understand how they are and what they were, like, okay, Mr. Daniel, I have not eaten and this is it. I'm like, okay, we'll get food for you. And that's how we begin to provide, provide food for them. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. And, yeah. So recently we got a very good food pack where we actually distributed to the kids. Miss Christine coordinated that for us and it was a very huge success. So thanks to Miss Christine for putting that out for us. Yeah, it was very, very amazing. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, is there anything in particular about, I guess, what is the, you said, like, like everyone else kind of funding and things. Um, what is, along with funding, like what is probably the struggle in, in running your school? Is, do you ever have difficulties with kids being able to get to class or is that quite okay? Okay. Um, for, for us, the most difficult part is the fact that I know that we do not have a good space. Now, the kids are very passionate and dedicated. Like, it's raining. Like, yesterday it was rain. It was a heavy downpour, but the kids were here in the rain. You know, yeah. this is, it, it's not like a place where you can actually say, I'm taking a bus or I'm taking a bicycle or something. There is, the kids have to walk maybe an hour or 30 minutes to my house for them to take trainings. So um, I would say the kids are already committed enough. But knowing fully well that I do not have a dance space is what makes it very, very sad. Because I know that sometimes they do periods like Anthony, the boy's video went viral, did some periods and his feet were, were injured. You know, yes, yeah, so you can imagine. But we do not have that. So he, it's just that the kids are very passionate, so they don't even feel any pain anymore. <laughs> it's become, it's just becoming part of them. Like, oh, so it's normal. Like, sometimes the that day, the video when in that after the video, it was like, Mr. Daniel, my feet is actually paining me. I saw he had bruises on his feet. I was like, oh, so sorry. And it was like, um, it's normal. I like ballet, so I don't feel the pain. I was heartbroken. That yeah. really just melted my heart. Like, you, like you didn't even. Like, why? So, you know, it's just, 
the space that is our problem now. We need yeah. a very good space, a good um, conducive training center for the kids to actually start training. Yeah, that would be that would be really very helpful. Yep. Yeah, I mean that was that was I think the the reason why that video went so viral is you saw exactly mm. what you're describing in your students is just such a love of ballet that obviously it contributes so much to their life. Um, mm -hmm. and their spirit and, and, and is healing in so many ways of, you know, bringing such joy that mm -hmm. even in the rain, even outside on concrete, mm -hmm. just having total blitz total dancing. Blitz. Yeah. It's yeah. actually very amazing. And I, the, the things that, like I'd like to tell people who are actually very more opportunities that there is no need to complain anymore because if my kids can actually do dance without proper standard studio or something, like most of the kids I train, it's very hard for you to know that they are self that they were trained by a self-trained ballet teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. so I'm just trying to encourage everyone that don't stop dancing. You are more opportune than we are here. So there is no need for you to complain. I don't know. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> way, I think, yeah. I think a lot of us like to complain just to hear ourselves complain. Mm -hmm. And it gives some perspective. Like if, if what you and your ballet school can do, like, People really don't have the right to complain when they're like, oh, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm not going to take this right now in the world. It's a difficult situation for everyone. It's I know. Changing for everyone and they're not used to it. But um, just seeing that and then like the people being happy, like students being completely happy, dancing mm -hmm. with a bar, holding onto a wall, dancing on concrete, mm -hmm. um, compared to a lot of dancers very comfortable in their home and they're like, mm, I'm dancing on my kitchen floor where they would probably be very happy to be inside. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So imagine if we have a, a studio of ours, it's going to be a dream come for the, for, the, for the kids because they are going to be turning and turning and turning. Like Anthony <laughs> loves to turn. So imagine having a very smooth area where he can actually do all his turns without yeah. any green or something. It's just going to be very amazing. But it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. You'll, you'll never be able to get them out of the studio. When, once you have a proper space, they'll like, you'll, you'll be like shoving them out the door, like, go home, it's midnight. <laughs> exactly. Even with that, they, they even, I had to tell them to go home today. Like, they didn't want to go home today. Like, they were just, they want to just keep on practicing. I'm like, no, you guys should go home. <laughs> it's just actually amazing. They're very amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Is there, Thank are there you you want to share um with our viewers before i go on to our last group who's going to speak um so if anyone would like to support us in anything you can actually send an email to us and um god oh, bless yeah. you oh, yeah. yeah and thank you very much biscuit ballerina for <laughs> making this up happen to us and um, thank you very much miss christine and the other amazing teachers who were able to hear their stories today thank you very yeah. very much I, from lagos I, I, Oh, I'm going to put links for everyone for donations for all of these different schools and organizations, but um, okay. in Daniel's case, they don't have um, a website where you can donate through, so it's better to contact him directly and figure yeah. out how you can help with donations. Exactly. Yes. Great. Well, thank yeah. you very much for taking the time to come and you know share your school story and, and what y'all are doing. Exactly. And I think it's just so inspiring. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, me too. Bye. Right. Thank care. you. Bye -bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. So the last person we have on today, we have a woman, Dana, that uh, she works with Movement Exchange. Um, so I'm going to add her in now. And Movement Exchange is uh, in in several places, but she will explain a little bit. And um, she also hi hi. How are you? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm right you. I'm very good, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Dana, will you please introduce yourself and then also Movement Exchange, tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely, so hi, my name is Dana Vanderberg. I'm currently located in Bloomington, Indiana um, in the United States. Um, Movement Exchange is a nonprofit organization that's based out of the state of California. Um, however, we operate university dance chapters um, across the United States and have year-round programming in Panama. Um, and our, um, our mission is to unite dance and service. Um, and we do this through our network of university chapter members, um, as well as our year round sustainable dance programming in Panama. Um, and then we also have um, international dance exchanges um, where our university chapter members and then anybody, right? So any person from, mostly we have people from the US, we've had people from all over the world 
um, join us in our programming in Panama where they both teach classes to our students that we teach year round um, and then also take classes from um, our Panamanian dance instructors. Um, and before I kind of go on, I just want to, you know, say that our my colleague, Violeta Martinez, who is our Panama country director, um, who supervises all of our programming in Panama and, you know, runs all of the exchanges. She was going to be on the call today. She can't for health reasons, um, but she, you know, says hello and I'm going to do my best to kind of talk about both sides of our organization um, without her present, but I just want to make sure that, you know, she's, she's invoked in the conversation today. Yeah. And I will also just say um, that on YouTube for the, for Christine's page with Trans Transformacion Ballet, um, she has an interview with Violeta that you can also see to, to, to hear her side and an explanation of everything happening in Panama and what she's doing. Um, and I saw also, I'm just going to say quickly, I saw in the comments, Maureen, that you, you lost your internet connection and you have it um, back again. But if you're still around after I uh, finish talking to Dana, I can come back to you and, and wrap up with you as well because you got cut off a little bit. Okay, but we will, we will continue. Dana. Um, so what you, you're going to say, um, you're going to talk a little bit about the two different sides of Transformacion Ballet. Um, could you explain like what how, yeah, a little bit more about each side. Yeah, so I think the thing that makes Movement Exchange unique, and I mean, it's really exciting to be a part of this conversation to see all of these other, you know, dancers and, you know, community, really community activists and leaders who are, you know, taking it upon themselves to provide accessible dance education to their various um, communities where they live. Um, and I think what makes Movement Exchange unique is that, you know, we do provide these sorts of dance education programming. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we're providing free dance education through our university chapters. So we have university students who are teaching their um, in different programs surrounding their university campuses. So domestic violence shelters, refugee agencies, programs for youth whose parents are incarcerated. Um, some also do work with adults, um, so nursing homes, um, children and adults with physical and developmental disabilities. Um, and so that's something that happens throughout the year in the U.S. Um, through our university chapter network, um, who are mainly dance majors in their universities. However, we don't limit that. Um, for us, dance is not about, you know, yes, we encourage, you know, proper training and, you know, technique. But really for us, it's about the love of movement that people have. Um, and, you know, we've noticed that particularly within the U.S. context, there's kind of a, a gap, right, where you go on to become a professional dancer or you kind of are told that you have to leave that behind. Um, mm -hmm. When for so many of us, you know, myself included, I was going to be a professional ballet dancer. I was on that track. Injuries happened like similar to Christine. Um, and you feel like there's no other outlet for that passion of yours. And so we're part of what Movement Exchange's goal is to do is to show that that is a passion and a skill set that you have that you can continue to make a difference. Um, so we're very invested in cultivating that ethos of civic engagement through dance, um, through anybody who wants to be involved. So that's particularly within our US chapter network um, mm -hmm. and then also our international dance exchanges, right? We accept anybody who has a love of movement and dance and from all different backgrounds, different styles, different levels of training. You know, Some have been professional dancers, some danced in high school. Um, and for us, that's really, really crucial. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of the ethos of our, our U.S. side. Um, within in Panama, um, we have, you know, it's run by Violeta, um, our Panama country director, who is Panamanian. Um, and then she is there running our year-round dance programming. Um, and we've been working in Panama for 11 years now. Um, so oh, wow. then pretty really much wow. working with the same organizations that we, our founder began working with um, 11 mm -hmm. years ago. So these are predominantly orphanages, although in Panama, they also kind of function as a foster care system. They're not all necessarily orphans um, in the sense of that they don't have family members, but residential facilities for kids that are not living with their homes or are orphaned. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are sending Panamanian dance instructors who are, we have break dance instructors, we have ballet, we have contemporary um, folkloric teachers, um, and they're providing weekly dance education to our programs in Panama um, and our students. And that ranges from about the ages of about five to 18. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we're really proud of that for an organization that's able to provide this level of sustainability. Um, wow. 
So that's kind of our, our Panamanian side. And then obviously our international dance exchanges kind of bridge those two, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, that provides people a chance to experience what our Panamanian dance programs are like, but then also see how this idea of accessible dance education, this idea of dance service, of community engagement through dance can be implemented anywhere. Um, so it's a very cyclical process where some people get introduced to us through the international dance exchange component, some get introduced to us through their university chapter, but it's all connected because you can dance anywhere, which I think this call has shown. Um, yeah. And anybody can bring that love and passion of movement to wherever they are, regardless of whatever backgrounds they have. Um, yeah. And I think that's what really makes us who we are. And, you know, we've cultivated a network of, you know, thousands of individuals who have been involved in our programming over the past 11 years. And so it's also really trying to change the dance world as well as like instill this as a value because it's what we do all the time as dancers. Um, we know how to connect with other people. We know the power that our bodies have to make a difference and to share and express and connect with others. But I think at least in the kind of Western classical concert dance tradition, that's been really lost. Um, and that's mm -hmm. for us, it's really important to provide a space where you can affirm as a community of dancers that I can make a difference through dance and I can build communities and be a civically engaged global citizen through dance. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's such a, a brilliant point. I just wanted to say right before you started explaining the two different programs, I was talking about Christine's YouTube channel. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. But I meant movement exchange. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> um, but so you, I, I read a bit of what you wrote about um, dance as an agent for social change. Yeah. Um, and there were so many aspects to it as far as like, um, you know, relation to the body and then also community and, and di different points. Could you elaborate a little bit on each of those? Yeah. And so I guess, and that's coming from my background. So in addition to running Movement Exchange, I'm also pursuing a PhD in um, social cultural anthropology focused on dance and community building. Um, mm -hmm. And I did my master's on the intersection of dance and human rights. Um, and I think this is important because we hear all the time, especially in moments like right now, where there is so much conversation and action and movements about how do we address systemic racism, inequality, lack of access to resources, all mm -hmm. of these very big, complicated, kind of big world questions that are obviously crucial, crucial to engage in. But I think the problem is that dance has kind of been left out of those conversations. It's, you know, it's you're a dancer, you, it's you know, something you do for fun, or something that you know, is just leisure. And for those of us who are dancers, we know that's not true. <laughs> you know, we <laughs> fundamentally know that when we enter a dance class, that that's not what it is, and that it has this real world power, and we build relationships, we build community. And so a lot of my research and kind of the work that Movement Exchange does as well is really trying to make that link explicit. Mm -hmm. That, you know, through our bodies, I think, well, I guess like through dance, a lot of the what I've really been exploring is how you know through dance we are individually dancing right it's my own body that is dancing it is my expression and you know mm -hmm. you can be telling me a hundred and one different steps I have to do but at the end of the day it's myself that's moving um and similar to what several of the other people on this call have talked about that moment of like I can do it that I got it you know I I have that power and so it cultivates that sense of you know individual expression and creativity um but at the same time you're most of the time you're dancing with others, right? You're dancing in a shared space with other people who are also experiencing that same phenomenon. And so it's a really interesting space where you are developing not just, you know, fun friend relationships, but you're actually learning what it means to be yourself within a collectivity of others. Um, mm. And at least in my own personal view, you know, I think that's really foundational to understanding what empathy is, what it means to build productive relationships um, and, you know, and we're not naive. It's not saying that dance is just going to change the world. If everybody dances, it's all better. You know, that's, that's too naive and it eliminates all the complexities of all of these challenges. But, you know, if we start, I think we always think we have to tackle these big problems from above. And it's, well, what, what happens if you start by actually building relationships with others and dancing? Um, and how can you leverage that to engage in more conversations, to problem solve together, regardless of what your backgrounds are? Um, we yeah. heard a lot about that today, too. 
you know, kids who come from different backgrounds, but are all dancing in the same space. Well, I mean, that's kind of where you start building that potential to create and explore and problem solve together. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. That makes me think a little bit about how, um, so both Christine and Marine were talking about, so Marine was saying for her really the importance of being very strict about the dress code, that all the students come in, they look the same, that they're equals and they, they build a community that no one is treated less than. Yeah. And they, they all enter on the same page. And then also Christine saying, you know, the same thing. Uh, but um, yeah, that are, it makes me think of even my experience when I was a student, the, the different dancers who were in class with me, or even now still as a professional, my, my colleagues who are from very different backgrounds, because we're all in a room working on the same thing, and we are all equal because of that, um, it really creates an understanding because you're not distracted by the differences you have. You're yeah. all working on a common goal. And so then when, you know, when, for example, um, the the new wave of uh, Black Lives Matter movements are coming up and talking about racism. The first people I turned to that I was like, okay, my dance friends, my yeah. my black dance friends, and it was like these are the people that I we understand each other the most on a certain level. So I want to understand them the most on a level that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And it's, so when you're talking about that, how you know this community and connections it's dance is a, is a small place to start. It's not going to save the world, but it is, it is like, I, we don't have to always like tackle first things like head on no. thinking we're going to solve the big issues. You can also start with the little things and, and that makes it easier to start to approach yeah. other bigger issues. And then, I mean, it's a pretty low access way to do it. I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, the barriers. I mean, we're all about accessible dance education, but you need your bodies, right? You don't even truly, I mean, it's nice to dance to music. You don't need it. Um, mm -hmm. And I know for us, you know, in our programming, we, we don't have any studios in any of the spaces where we're operating. In the U.S., right, people are going to these spaces. They are in this organization's gym, this school gymnasium. We are, we are going to the different youth organizations that we partner with, right? You know, our mm -hmm. studio is their gym or, you know, the outside parking lot. Um, or not parking lot, sorry, like basketball court. Um, and... And I think, you know, that's, that's really upending. And I think what a lot of these programs are, are showing, and especially also thinking of the pandemic, right? Like, I think we've seen, in my opinion, pretty belatedly um, within the dance community, all of a sudden, all of these organizations are going, wait, now we can't all gather in a studio. How do we teach dance? And what, yet we found a way, right? Everybody is like, oh, wait a second. You, it's not, I deal to be learning through zoom in a living room I think we all can agree but you still can keep learning and dancing and you know we facilitated several international dance exchanges with people from Colombia Argentina India the U.S. New Zealand and it's like that's really cool and that's a chance for us I think this is a moment for us all as a dance community to kind of jump on this moment of recognizing that we need to make dance accessible but also that, you know, dance is already primed to do this. Um, and we just need to be committed to kind of carrying that forward after this moment of crisis. Um, and so, I mean, I think for me, that's something that Movement Exchange is really committed to as well, is kind of trying to position ourselves as a space where we can have these conversations. Um, yeah. We've been talking a lot within our own organizations about how do we decolonize dance pedagogy in our teaching? Um, how do we really think about how we're teaching, who we're teaching, what we're teaching, um, and that these are conversations that are happening now that we need to continue and that this is, this is a good moment to do that. And having conversations like this, like this is just so exciting. Like, you know, we've been talking with people from Indonesia, Nigeria, Haiti, Guatemala, the U.S., and Violetta was here, Panama. And I mean, that's, that's the exciting thing. And I think as dancers, we are able to, you know, to, to do this. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, I mean, and not to gloss over the challenges too, like we, like to be totally upfront, we haven't been able to offer dance classes to our students in Panama because Panama is in such a strict lockdown right now. We cannot send anybody there to bring the proper technology to get them connected. Um, um, and, yeah. you know, that's, that's, a, that's a reality. And we've tried to kind of find workarounds, but I mean, our teachers cannot go <laughs> and the students do not have the type of technological access that they need to connect. Um, and so, you know, it's, 
it's there's still challenges and inequities in this these types of conversations but it to me it's it's a promising point that we have this opportunity now to engage in these conversations and to actually make changes um yeah so well as you as you work on your phd and you're you're doing all these studies and really like researching into it um do you have certain hopes for the future of programs like all of the ones that were introduced today like what sort of um, further developments do you think like with time we can add into these sorts of programs that you know will, will make them even better I think I think there is a lot of I, I have a lot of optimism and hope um, about it just because we're seeing these conversations throughout various levels of the dance community both you know individual Facebook groups that have started that are welcoming of everybody to yeah. um, you know, conversations like this to innovative, you know, online programming that people are doing to reach their students. Um, mm -hmm. I think my one concern, and we've talked about this a lot today, is like funding is an issue for like, I mean, most of the time, I mean, we are an established nonprofit, small, but established, but like funding is also our biggest concern, especially yeah. now that, you know, our exchanges aren't running and, you know, donor streams aren't the same as they were. Um, and I think the one thing that is, potentially a, a concern um, is that, you know, we're in this moment where everybody's talking about, you know, access and social justice. And there's just still that part of me that's a little bit worried that, you know, people are still going to kind of push dance below. Um, and I think this is now a time more than ever than dancers need to advocate and say that this is why dance is important. Um, and this is kind of why I, I really encourage everybody who is involved in this is really learn how to articulate why dance is important to you, why dance is important to your students. Because yeah. most people outside of the dance world, they won't get it. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's highly problematic because then you get to the point of applying for grants, applying for funds. And, you know, it's like, you, they're like, that's really cool. But, and we really need to change that culture of, you know, run, like kind of setting the arts and dance in particular aside as outside of these conversations. And so yeah. that's why it's crucial that we have these conversations and carry this on our platforms because we all know that what we're doing is making an impact. And I think in general, dancers and dance organizations need to become more able to articulate what that means. Um, yeah. Because then my concern is that we still will get kind of pushed, you know, aside. And now yeah. is not that time. Like we need to seize this moment and, make our voices and our, through our dance, through our expression, through our art, you know, louder than ever. And I think, um, I think a lot of times when we say like dance outreach programs, a lot of times people probably associate it too much with necessarily like going into the dance profession. Like just yeah. because the child is given the opportunity to learn dance, it doesn't mean that we're expecting them to become a professional dancer yeah. and that's the end game it is just then like all of the additional benefits and so it doesn't mean that just because they're maybe not going to end up getting you know pre-professional high level training that it's not incredibly life-changing for yeah. them yeah exactly and I think for us I mean we've never our goal has never been to turn out the next and I mean we need to have I mean I come from a professional ballet background like that like we need to have that and like that has to be you know that that's not like that needs to go by the wayside but you know our goal is to first and foremost center the joy of movement and you know center what that looks like in a class um, you can do that by also providing like really high level technique <laughs> you know they're not they're not it's not either or um, you know for us we really are focused on expression and the joy of movement and you know we have our students that then say hey you know I want to pursue this further and then we kind of figure out what those avenues are you know we supported a student to study at the National Dance School of Panama you know once he kind of got yeah. to that point um, and you know for us it's more measuring you know we've been working in these programs for 11 years we had students who started with us when they were you know nine or ten and now you know they're 18 19 20 and they're not necessarily professional dancers by any stretch of the imagination, but now they're choreographing for our students. You know, they are wanting to help and assist. They are, and it's looking at those type of metrics and changes and really focusing that first and foremost in whatever, you know, pedagogy or method that you are, you're striving for. Um, yeah. And I think that's a really important place for all of us to start um, in all dance organizations. And I think that that's also going to, enable further discussions and advocacy about um you know what dance can do 
because then yeah. you can actually say it's not about the the dancer who is now in this xyz company it's okay maybe they are in this this xyz company but also they feel like a dancer regardless of what title they have um yeah. for me i feel like a dancer more now than i ever did um when i was you know studying to become a professional dancer you know i was right there and you know i feel like more of a dancer today because i understand what dance can do and does for me and for others um and i think we all need to carry that with us um wherever we go yeah, yeah exactly i i uh i hope that i don't know maybe someone out there will be watching this video who has a dance school already and you know even if maybe you don't have the time or the means to do it some of these incredible people from today are doing that they're running these ballet schools and organizations um but even if you do have a dance school realizing the impact of inviting in a, a student on scholarship and mm -hmm. how that can change them in, in the, the incredible social emotional uh you know mental benefits that can come from including them in this dance community yeah. and you know you know i think of course dance schools are difficult to run and you know it's a lot of budgeting and it's it's hard to maintain but just thinking even just one student to have one yeah. student on scholarship that one extra person in the room um and give them that chance how you can really impact their life yeah and really i mean it's it, it's not i mean it's hard to quantify what we do right i mean we all have our numbers of how many kids in classes how many you know and and, and if you look at movement exchanges numbers they're impressive sure you know after 11 years but that's mm -hmm. not where the impact really is. I mean, you need those, unfortunately, for a lot of grants and that sort of thing. But it's really also recognizing, you know, those individual stories. And um, we all have them. That's why we're on this call, I'm assuming. You know, everybody who's tuned in today jumped on this call because they have that. They have that reason for why they love dance. You know, they're following, you know, your page, our pages. And because dance has something that means something to them. And it's mm -hmm. different for each of us. Um, which is wonderful, but it's, you know, that's why we need to ask our students, why do they love dance? Why are they coming to dance? Um, and, you know, where are they going to take that with them? And that, that doesn't need to stop or end with a professional dance career. I mean, if it does, fantastic. But if it doesn't, you can be just as happy dancing in your living room all the time, um, you know, and dancing outside with your friends. Um, yeah. And especially now, I think, with the pandemic, where we're really being forced to be mindful of our bodies and who we're with, I think we, we value that even more, right? That's why we have yeah. dance classes in our living rooms, right? Um, and so I think just remembering that. And, and so that's something that, you know, I think hopefully, you know, from hearing, you know, me talk today and what Movement Exchange really strives to do is to provide that space for us to build that community, centering that as our, our main value. Um, and Beautiful. so... Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today and uh, really explaining not just movement exchange, but also your your studies and, and where you are also with your PhD and, you know, the kind of more, um, you know, I would say like academic side of analyzing what schools and programs around the world can do for, for students through dance. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thanks to Christine for, you know, helping facilitate this and building the connections. And also just thank you to everybody who spoke before. Um, it's been the highlight of my day. Um, and I just, I know this is just the very beginning of, you know, future collaborations between all of us. And um, I'm just really yeah, grateful. Definitely. And I'm wishing everybody a wonderful rest of their day with lots of joyful movement. So yes, thank likewise. you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye. So I'm going to see if, um, Maureen, if you're still there, I can add you back in to, to wrap up what you were saying before, before you got cut off. Um, and then that this will be the end of our talk for today. So we're just going to wait for Maureen. Hey. Hey, Maureen. Hi. Um, I'm hoping the internet stays in, but I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> um, so I'll just like open the floor to you any last thoughts last words you wanted to share also based on maybe what everyone else was saying or things about your school well it's basically the same thing she was saying like we're not expecting these kids to become professional dancers but it's what we can it's the quality of life that we can give them through our dance schools mm -hmm. it's helping them be able to think butterflies fly because like i told you around here butterflies don't fly but it's the mm -hmm. fact that we can try to make them think butterflies fly and that flowers are pretty and 
that it's a beautiful world. I mean, the fact that I was able to take 40 of my kids into YAGP, you know. I just find that so amazing. That's really, you know. I am, we're, you know, I love YAGP, don't get me wrong, but we're a very black school to be going into YAGP. And you can see a lot of the faces turn when my school walked in, like, oh. You know? But that's what they need. That's what, that's what so much of the dance community needs is they need to see more people from different backgrounds that look different, that have different experiences. Um, so that and it, it wasn't only seeing us walk in, like that's what they need because it wasn't only seeing us walk in, it was seeing the reaction like, oh, these kids can actually dance. They're not here just as token kids. These kids can actually dance and get the scores. And I think that was even more of a shock than seeing us walk in. Seeing us on stage was again, a bigger whoa. Amazing. Amazing. So it's taking 15 out of those 40 kids, 15 kids that never thought they would ever be on a plane or even on a, ha a passport and seeing their faces when they were going to go onto that plane. Like, wow. you know, their parents, their grandparents, nobody in their family have ever been on planes. And these kids travel both to Florida and New York. They've been to Disney World. And it's watching the different demeanors in their life like these is thinking of them before this trip and seeing them now the way they react to a situation after this trip that this is what we're about mm. it's yeah because i think i can imagine that um for, for kids who were never on a plane before and getting to not only fly on a plane but fly on a plane to a very different country to uh, a country that like the u.s can be very overwhelming for people because it's just you know big and flashy at times and um but then also maybe like the the inspiration and, and realization that okay like there's there's possibilities out there in the world i got things i can work towards i've got things to motivate me it's not just like uh, me staying in my bubble through dance i'm exposed to different things and and that really can can inspire our kids it's, it was really inspiring for these kids. And it was also the preparation. Like we had to prepare them what a plane was going to be like. like you're going to get to the States and you're going to see I-95. These kids have never seen a highway before. So, I mean, you take them from their home, you put them on a plane, then you put them on a highway for two hours. Then you arrive at Orlando with Disney World. And it's like, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh. What it is was, happening? Yeah. So the world. <laughs> and then you tell them, go to bed. And they're just like, so it's just, that's what we're really about. I mean, yes, it's important to us that they learn the proper discipline of ballet, that they learn the proper ballet, but it's also how we can help them make a better life for themselves, how we can help them dream of, a, not even like dream of a better life, just not dream of being somebody that's going to sweep the floor somewhere, but being dreaming of being the person that's going to be behind the desk. Yeah. Yeah. That's, wow. that's what we, that's what, and our main thing is trying to find sponsors to help us keep these kids in dance because like we have eight kids in an orphanage that's that live about two hours away and just the funding for them to come to dance three times a week is not easy and it's it's just things like that that that's the hard part for us because these kids deserve it they're amazing kids they're they're my family these yeah. and they're amazing kids and they deserve it and it's hard i will i will never give up Bloody talk. Yeah, I can I can only imagine. And uh, amazing the the hard work that you and also everyone else who spoke today puts into not only giving these kids opportunities but giving them stability with that, giving them some consistency of you know there's there's a studio there or there's a teacher there that always wants them to thrive and love dance and enjoy and work and move forward and, and like so many factors that that. Um, having that support or having that backing of, okay, I have a teacher who believes in me and, and I know that all these things might happen in my world and in my life, but there's this consistency of I have a dance teacher who believes in me. Yeah, I think the consistency of the dance school is, IDD is there, the dance school is there, has helped our kids through this very tough year. So we're going to keep going. And like I was telling Danielle the other day on the phone, it's a lot Hello. I'm here. Okay. It's a lot about keeping our real identity, like being who we are. Like we are a Haitian dance school. We're black, we're Haitian, and we're proud. And I don't want to be a dance school in the States. I want to be who I am with, you know, 
my not a real studio that's in a dance house right that's in a house that's been remodeled to be a dance studio but just to be that and to keep our identity and to teach the kids to be proud of who they are not mm -hmm. wanting to be somebody else yeah yeah wonderful 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 motive of what what you're trying to do with your students and i'm sure they are feeling like the incredible impact of it um so thank you very much um i will also include um for Marine School, I will also include links to the website and then how you can donate. So for each one, I will put it in the description of this video. I will put them in uh, links as well in my story so that they're easy to click. And um, I hope that, yeah, I hope that uh, this was really informative for everyone who tuned in. Um, and I'm so happy that I was able to share, you know, your presence and everyone else's presence with people who follow the ballerina. Thank you so much for having all of us, not just me, but all of us. And thank you, Christine, for putting you and me in touch. Oh, thank you. You have a nice day. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay, so this is the end of um, our, oh, I just saw that Christine wrote, can you share about how your program runs amidst the lack of funding and political instability and implications for what and why you do what you do and the importance of your studio as a home? Oh, should I, oops. If you're still there, Maureen, maybe I bring you back just to answer that question. And then I go back. Oh, I'm so bad with uh, Instagram. Let me see if she's still there. I'll add her back. Last thing. I might have even lost the question. I can't scroll through this. I'm terrible. Oh, she might be gone. <laughs> Christine, would you mind writing your question again? It was talking about the, uh, I can't scroll and find it anymore. Oh, I found it. Oh, I think Bermin might be gone though. Okay, we, I will write her, we will write her and we'll ask her to, to share on her page, maybe in a post or something. Um, so anyway, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, I, like I said, I hope it really inspired you. If you want to learn more about these schools, of course you can visit their Instagram, their website, you can donate. Um, also, Christine with Transformation Ballet on her YouTube channel, she has longer interviews with each of them that you can really learn a lot more and go in depth of uh, into what these schools and organizations are doing for their community. Hold on, let's see. Yes, hold on, Marine is back. She will answer this question. I am adding you. Sorry, I had another call come in about somebody who wants a scholarship. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I, right after I let you go, I saw there was one question and I wanted to just, um, ask you the question and, and see if, uh, you could answer. Um, the question was, can you share about how your program runs amidst the lack of funding and political instability and the implications for what and why you do what you do and the importance of your studio as a home? Okay. How does it run with all the situation is that we have, a few, we have a few kids that pay and we have a few sponsors that send us money. So we do our best. I mean, I have a second job. We, I work at a bus station and I put everything I have into it. And we do our best to keep the program running and afloat. Mm -hmm. And the importance of our program as a home is like I told you in our interview a while ago, I think right now our kids are more into the dancing because that's the one thing they know. IDE mm. is always there for them. Whether the rocks are throwing, whether the fires are burning, whether there's a pandemic in the world, Lynn and Maureen are here. We're always there. I'm, my phone's ever, we're always a phone call away. So I think for a world that's so unstable for our kids, knowing that their dance school is here helps them wake up in the morning and get through it all. And yeah. I see a lot of studios tell me, how do you push ballet? How are you kids? My kids, if we skip hip hop class to do ballet, they don't, they don't mind because that's, kids need a, dis in a crazy world, kids need that discipline of ballet and it's really working out for us. And Wonderful. how do I get the courage to keep it, to keep doing what I'm doing? Honestly, I love my kids. 
and my son is right here on the other side of the, t of the phone and he knows he's my only biological child but i have 200 kids that are my kids they are my students and i would do anything in the world for them that's beautiful that's really beautiful well thank you for for coming back and answering that question and it's really it's really thank touching you. all right thank you <laughs> Take care. Have a nice day. All right. You too. Bye, Marine. Bye. So, yeah, this will be now the official end of uh, Dance Talks. And like I listed before, I'll, I'll include all the links. So I hope everyone can um, learn more about all these organizations. Donate if you can. Um, it, it makes a huge difference for them and in, in all of their needs and what they're offering to uh, their kids. And I hope everyone has a very safe and healthy and um, wonderful rest of their day. And I look forward to doing more talks soon. Take care. Bye everyone. <laughs>